All right, good morning. I am here with Reverend uh, Father Kevin Doherty to discuss um, what is called the Convergence Movement. Uh, Reverend Kevin is from Lincoln, Pennsylvania, and he serves as an abbot or father and co-founder of Kindling Fires and Ministers in Elizabeth, in Elizabeth, Pennsylvania area. He was ordained to Christian ministry in April 2013 and became an elder or priest with the Convergent Christian Communion in October 2017. At that point, it was called the Anthem Network. And then he was commissioned as an abbot in June 2018 and elected the secretary treasurer of the CCC in February 2020. Uh, before found, co-founding Kindling Fires, he was also involved in, uh, the, in an ecumenical Franciscan orders and served in a variety of churches. Uh, like the Apostle Paul, Kevin is a worker, priest, or tent maker, see Acts 18.3, which means that he ministers largely as a volunteer and has a secular job to support his ministry. Currently, Kevin works as a clerk in Elizabeth, Pennsylvania for Cohen Oil. Uh, the reason that we're discussing or having this interview today is um, kind of centers around the demographics of my students. So I teach at an Episcopal school, which means that we have a daily chapel and a monthly Eucharist. So my students, whatever their religious affiliation, and we have a variety of religious affiliations, um, the majority not being Episcopalian. Actually, I think the largest demographic represented in our school is Roman Catholic. So we have um, students who are familiar with liturgy, whether it be because they are a part of a, a tradition that practices Christian liturgy, or because they attend a school where they see it all the time. And then my class religion in the United States, they studied Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement this week. Uh, the Pentecostal charismatic uh, branch of Christianity is what I'm very familiar with because I was raised, uh, at least by my mother, uh, um, in that branch of Christianity. My father was an atheist, so I didn't have any Christianity coming from that side, but my mother raised me in Pentecostalism. So I'm very familiar with Pentecostalism. I teach an Episcopal school where there's liturgy and um, my students are gonna have this same kind of interesting mixture of liturgy on the one hand and Pentecostal charismatic spiritual on the other. And it would be really easy for them to get the sense that these are two totally different spheres of Christianity. And so one of the reasons why I'm excited about this interview is you're gonna to talk to us uh, today about a expression of Christianity that doesn't see these as two different spheres, but sees them as reconciling and coming together. So, uh, Father Kevin, can you please tell everyone why I'm talking with you about this topic, and what's your relationship with the Convergence Movement, which we'll get into more detail in a minute what that is, but uh, tell us what it is that um, your relationship with it is and why I'm talking to you about this topic. Sure. Um, so, as you said, I serve as an elder or a presbyter or a priest. They use the terms interchangeably. And the, the group I work with is called the Convergent Christian Communion. Before then, we were called the Anthem Network, and that was when we had more of a Pentecostal approach. Mm -hmm. And so as part of the CCC, and as a, a, a priest in the CCC, I'm part of the wider Convergence Movement family. Mm -hmm. And not only do I serve within the Convergence Movement, but I have a very wide range of uh, religious background in mm -hmm. regard to that. I, I've been... I've been active in Pentecostal and charismatic churches, been active in Roman Catholic churches. I'm never taking the sacraments, of course, but being mm -hmm. visiting and being friendly with them. Yeah. And have a lot of Anglican friends and colleagues. So I'm kind of in smack dab in the middle of it all. Very nice. Part of the convergence movement, but also having those connections elsewhere that brings it all together. So let's then talk about the convergence convergence movement. What is the convergence movement? Uh, convergence movement. Uh, where did it come from, and when did it come into existence? Sure. So, of course, the start of it all is Pentecostalism, which so you guys talked about that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And then, fast forward from Pen the start of Pentecostalism to about the 1960s, there's a movement called the Charismatic Movement, which had its start primarily in the Episcopal and Roman Catholic churches at the time, where these traditionally mainline and sacramental churches embraced the gifts of the Spirit and started believing in, in tongues and prophecy and healing and started experimenting with some style, new styles of worship. And everybody knows about the charismatic movement. It's very popular. Right. But then 
there was a flip side to that movement that most people don't realize existed. And that was when uh, many Pentecostal churches and independent charismatic churches embraced a sacramental or Catholic approach to Christianity. Mm. And there was, this, there was a lot of cooperation between these two movements early on. And so you see some overlap. Um, for example, the Alliance of Renewal Churches, their Convergence Movement mm. group, they were originally called Lutheran Charismatic Renewal. They were the Lutheran, mainline Lutheran Charismatic Movement, and then eventually parted ways with the mainline church and became part of the Convergence Movement. And so there's this blending happens. And the Convergence Movement emphasizes the blending of Christian traditions. The common phrase is three streams, which are sacramental, evangelical, and charismatic. Mm -hmm. Of course, sacramental refers to the historic Catholic approach to faith that would include Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Episcopalians, and many others. Mm -hmm. Then the second group is evangelical Protestant. And when they say evangelical Protestant, they often mean you know, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, mm -hmm. and then charismatic or Pentecostal, which emphasizes the spirit. Right. And the general idea was that these three streams are not in competition. Mm -hmm. All three of them have something healthy to provide to the church, and we need to take them all. Mm -hmm. So the sacramental or Catholic stream brings the historic Orthodox faith that everybody shared for the first thousand years. Mm -hmm. The evangelical side brings a strong appreciation for the Word of God, because mm -hmm. a lot of churches, especially in the later Middle Ages, due to high there was high levels of literacy. Um, there's lots of church bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And so the, the scriptures were kind of set aside. Right. And then the final group, Pentecostal and Charismatic, that, that stream emphasizes the living spirit. The fact that God didn't just stop acting 2000 years ago, but continued to act through church history in a variety of methods. So what the Convergence Movement said was, we're going to blend these things together. We're going to try to merge them all together. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying, instead of emphasizing one or the other and being lopsided in our faith, we believe that we wanted to be well-rounded and the convergence movement so it starts out with pentecostals and charismatics mm -hmm. many of these people are embracing some liturgical forms and, a, and there's a variety of ways that this happened so some groups would join previous existing denominations like the episcopal church mm -hmm. some groups would try to recreate something else so one of the earliest groups is the evangelical orthodox church they're founded by archpriest peter gilquist he was one of the the campus through, campus through Crusade for Christ leaders at it first. Mm. And that group ended up having something with a schism where the one smaller side of it remained part of the Convergence Movement. They're still called the Evangelical Orthodox Church. Mm. And the a large, larger portion of that group joined Antiochian or Archdiocese. So they're canonic Orthodox now. Right. Um, other early groups would be the Charismatic Episcopal Church. And they didn't come from the Episcopal Church, but rather they were Pentecostals that embraced an Episcopal polity and sacraments in a Catholic faith, and that's where mm -hmm. the name comes from. It's a little bit confusing. Yeah. Because the word <laughs> Episcopal has multiple meanings. Right. Um, another one's the Communion of Evangelical Episcopal Churches. Um, my group, the Converted Christian Communion, we're, we're pretty new. Right. The yeah. other groups that were founded decades ago from the 60s and 90s, where we were founded just in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And... So we're, we're kind of the second generation of the convergence movement. Okay. And in, in these different convergence groups, there's different expressions. Like I said, there's, one group that's, there's at least one group that leans Orthodox. You have groups that lean Anglican, and that's true for the Charismatic Episcopal Church and the Communion of Evangelical Episcopal Churches. Mm -hmm. There's groups that have a blended approach like mine, where we have people who take from Roman Catholic sources, Anglican sources, Episcopal sources. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the, I know in the Evangelical Episcopal Churches, they have several rites, I believe it's six of them. And on the one hand, you have contemporary worship styles and it ranges all the way up to Anglo-Catholic. Wow. So the Convergence Movement is intentionally kind of confusing. Right. We're intentionally blending things together and trying to bring people together. And it's different from ecumenism because ecumenism is the belief that we should cooperate but remain separate. Right. So you have, say, the Episcopal Church and Roman Catholic Church they are two different churches. They recognize their differences, but they might work together. Right. In the convergence perspective, we're interested in blending together. We want we want to see mergers. We want to see, you know, multiple styles of worship coexisting, multiple styles of ministry coexisting. We we want to really integrate the whole church together again. 
Very nice. Uh, so for my students, they're going to be, again, familiar mostly with, with Roman Catholic, Episcopal expressions uh, as far as their experience, but also they're now going to learn about Pentecostalism. What are, what are some things, just in brief, because you've kind of covered this already, but if you were to give, um, maybe try to give a visualized example for my students, if they were to see the Episcopal and Catholic and Pentecostal aspects kind of converging together in one of these churches, what would that look like? Well, there's actually, there's a YouTube video you should look up. It's a really good example. It's, um, it, it's a charismatic Episcopal church in Paris, France, I believe. And it shows one of their worship services. And what you'll see is they're all very, very well vested, all the flowing robes and mitres and the staves and all, you know, all the traditional vestments. Right. But then they're also dancing and shouting and they possess, they're kind of like, have bounce to their step. Right. So it, it's like a traditional Catholic mass or Book of Common Prayer Eucharist service but there's more activity to it, more contemporary music. Um, my bishop, our presiding bishop's church, Solomon's Porch, they, the way they do it is their services are based upon the Book of Common Prayer. Mm -hmm. The vestments are more Roman Catholic in style. Mm -hmm. And then they have a lot more contemporary music and a lot more use of technology, um, PowerPoints, that kind of stuff. So it's, you can see very clearly this the mixture happening where you got more contemporary worship elements meeting with traditional liturgical elements. Very interesting. Yeah, that would be, uh, I'm going to definitely have to look it up and see if I can find a way to um, include the link so that my students can look at that and other people who watch this interview will be able to look at that um, particular example. Um, as people are listening to this, they may hear all these different variations of the convergence movement and um, attempts at, the, at this movement that sometimes have already splintered. And so one critique people always have of Christianity in general is it seems that new denominations are birthed daily. So why uh, the Convergence Christian Communion? Um, why not just try to work within, say, an Episcopal setting that's charismatic or a liturgical Pentecostal church? What is it about this movement that is, uh, we might say, unique and necessary? Well, of course, I think the most unique element of it is the fact that we're looking to actually syncretize. Mm -hmm. We're looking to really bring things together in a more cohesive way. Now, in, but really, the, the, all, when it comes to all churches, the main thing is relationships, from my experience. Right. In my case, I stumbled into it, and I became friendly with everybody. Right. And so now it's, to me, it's, I'm serving long friends and family. Right. So the, the main reason why I'm in it is because I, I know and love people in it. Yes. And I think that's true of every church. But yeah. now, regarding the Convergence Movement as a whole, I, I think the fact that we try to we try to bring together the fullness of Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. I think that's unique. Mm -hmm. Most churches have their specific denominational approach, and they really emphasize that. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, in the Roman Catholic Church, they really emphasize being, that they think they're the one true Catholic Church, right. and the Roman rite is the main rite, and there's a strong preference for Roman traditions. Even, even in Roman Catholic Church, other Eastern Catholic churches, but they're kind of sidelined, right. typically, especially in the West. So, and that's just one example. And every church has these, these kind of institutional biases that take place. And the fact that we're trying to tear down those barriers, I think is really important. Now, regarding my place in the Convergent Christian Communion specifically, of course, all that's still true. We're, we're working to blend and we're working to um, promote wholeness and cooperation between all Christians. Mm -hmm. But the group I serve in particular, we're almost a we're essentially an island of misfit toys, is the best way of thinking about it. Because <laughs> yeah. most of us came from larger churches initially. Right. And then something went wrong on that path somewhere. Right. So, and this is, I think, true of Pentecostalism as a whole. The early Pentecostals were, I mean, and look where they're popular. They're were, they were popular with black Christians, poor whites, a lot of women, right. um, you know, Hispanics. They were, they were popular with groups that the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant churches would not deal with. Right. And the convergence movement's been much the same way, I believe. And which isn't surprising. I mean, it, it, we emerge out of Pentecostalism. Right. And then the games of the CCC in particular, we have this, this unique group, mix, this unique mixture of people who have very various experiences in mainline churches where it is it hasn't gone well. Right. Um, so we, there's people like myself who come from a more working class background. Mm -hmm. And the educational requirements for the mainline churches were not even remotely attainable mm -hmm. 
And so the fact that we have a more case-by-case -case basis for ordination where you work with a mentor and your, and your education is tailored to you and it's mostly, it, well, it's mostly free. And it's, we, we do it from, for the ministry of the church, not for, the, not to fund institutions. Right, right. So that, that's a big benefit. Um, that's one reason why we get some people. But we also get people who were excluded for one reason or another. So my bishop, Bishop Rebecca, she's the person I immediately report to. Mm -hmm. She used to be an Episcopalian. She grew up in the Episcopal Church way back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. she's, she's 70 years old now. And at that point, the Episcopal Church was really still res wrestling with the question of women's ordination. Uh, and the coastal dioceses, like, say, Philadelphia, New York, or San Francisco, had no problem with it. Right. But the inland dioceses did. Right. And that continued to be the case up through the 90s. And so she was barred from ministry in Episcopal Church because of her gender. Uh, and then from there, what ended up happening was if she wanted to try to reconcile and go back, there's a problem. And it's the fact that, first of all, the education that she has won't match up with the Episcopal Church requirements. Hmm. And second of all, the Episcopal Church has mandatory retirement ages, primarily because of the pension program. Right. So even if she wanted to go back now, she couldn't. Right. And I, you know, I have a, a colleague who was an Episcopalian as well. And this is a few years ago, and it turned, but they found out he happened to be gay. Huh. And that didn't work out because of that. So we have a lot of people who come to us from mainline churches where something has gone wrong in that process somewhere. Right. And and of course, we're unique in that regard. Um, much of the converted movement is socially conservative. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Anglican, Church, the Anglican Church in North America has a lot of connections to the converted movement as well. Interesting. But the group I serve in the CCC, we're unique in that we're affirming. Right. And that the majority of our members are LGBT. And um, yeah, so there's, this, there's been a lot of stories where we've tried to look into mainline churches and we tried to get a foot in those doors and it just hasn't happened. Interesting. And um, yeah, that's, 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 I think that's really the gist of it. It's a lot of us have tried and it hasn't worked out. And yeah. also, I've noticed that the charismatic element has uh, been mostly purged from the Episcopal Church, for example. Yeah. It exists really strong in the Roman Catholic Church, but yeah. the charismatic element in the Episcopal Church or similar mainline Protestant churches, it's, they've parted ways in some way, yeah. from my experience. They, they've gone and they've splintered off or they were too unconventional or too, they, they broke too many rules. Right. So there's been a lot of places where the charismatic movement as a whole has pushed the envelope too much yeah. for a lot of the traditional churches to be comfortable. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I really like the Island of Misfit Toys uh, example because it shows that there's not just kind of one rationale for why people have joined this particular uh, movement, but there's a lot of different reasons that are happening. Now, on your guys' on the CCC website, um, for the Convergence Christian Communion, there's four points of identity, which I'd like to kind of go through um, briefly. And one of them you just talked about. So I'll just go through the four at, and, and, and you'll see if you can explain them so that viewers and my students will better understand what this means. The first one, uh, and you've kind of hinted at this already, is that you guys are open and affirming. What does that mean for you? Well, simply put, it means that we're open to everybody. Right. Um, for us, we, we, we don't use gender as a reason to exclude coordination. Um, we, we are welcoming to LGBT people. We practice same-sex marriages. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't have any issue with people of other ra racial or ethnic backgrounds being involved with us. Right. Um, and of course, the, the last one, racial and ethnic backgrounds, that used to be a problem decades ago, not so much anymore. Right. But there's still a lot of churches where there's a lot of these types of social barriers. Yeah. And to be open and affirming simply means that we don't believe in having those barriers. Very good. And uh, what do you guys mean? And again, we've already touched on this a little bit, but just to uh, define the language, when you say we are charismatic. Well, that means that we have Pentecostal DNA. Okay. We believe very strongly in the gifts of the spirit today. We believe people speak in tongues today. They prophesy today. They heal today. We believe that the spirit of God is literally present in people's lives. Right. And that directly ties into our sacramental perspective. Because when you have the sacraments and you believe in a sacramental approach, you believe God is present in those elements. And in, in something like my, our presiding bishop, Kenny, he actually teaches transubstantiation. He believes that the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, it, it's literally the body and blood of Christ through a miraculous event. Right. So it's all, it's all connected. That's why we, that's why that, that Pentecostal movement slowly veered toward the sacramental approach. 
very interesting. Now, one of the words that's going to be extremely contested in our contemporary culture is this third word. You say, we are evangelical. What does that mean? Well, that's one of those words that has evolved quite a bit over the years. Right. And we typically mean it in a, in a number of senses. So first of all, in the first, in the first few centuries of the church, the word evangelical just meant Christian. It meant you were a gospel-centered person. Right. So we mean it in that sense. We also mean it in the medieval sense, which refers to somebody who tries to live like Jesus. Mm. So, for example, St. Francis of Assisi was considered an evangelical, mm. and he took the evangelical vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And so the word evangelical in the Middle Ages referred to somebody who's trying to emulate Christ. And so we definitely seek to do that. Mm -hmm. Additionally, evangelical meant Protestant. Mm -hmm. The Lutherans used that word for themselves. Right. And we don't really see ourselves as Protestant anymore. Right. But we definitely have that, that background in many respects. Mm -hmm. And we definitely have a strong appreciation for preaching, a strong appreciation for the scriptures, a strong appreciation for reforming and renewing the church. Mm -hmm. And so we definitely mean evangelical in those senses of the word. And also there's the English movement called evangelicalism, right. which that, I mean, most people, when they think of evangelicalism, they think of the last 30 years when it became very politicized in the United States. But really evangelicalism dates back about 300 years and it has its start with several revival movements in Europe. Mm -hmm. And these revival movements made this push to emphasize personal piety, um, would be, you know, have a personal conversion. That's where the phrase born again gets so popular. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, the push to do missionary work, to reach out and share the gospel with other people. And that's why groups like the Methodist and Baptist got so big, because they right. were evangelical Christians who emphasized that conversion experience and that evang evangelistic side of being evangelical. Right. And so we definitely incorporate a lot of those elements. Mm -hmm. We definitely we want people to take seriously the Bible to learn it and study it and not in a fundamentalistic sense we believe it needs to be read maturely and with a lot of nuance and context in mind we want people to share the gospel and to live the gospel out and also it's just being honest about our our spiritual dna mm -hmm. you know being in the convergence movement there there is an element of evangelical protestantism that's coming into that into right. that movement so it's you're right it's a, it's a complicated word but it's it's an important word that's a helpful way of explaining it, this history of the various layers of it, because you're right, I think most people are going to think the American context, they're going to think the politicized context. Uh, this helps reframe that. Uh, lastly, we've talked a bit about this too, but just now we've seen open and affirming, welcoming all people. There's charismatic, of the Pentecostal elements, there's the evangelical emphasis on living like Christ and respect for the scriptures. Um, sacramental, what does that mean for you guys? Well, historically, sacramental theology refers to this, it's kind of, you know, it's, I'm trying to think of a way to put it as simple as possible. The, the belief that there's certain rites in the church that communicate God's grace. There's certain things in the church like baptism or the Eucharist um, or anointing the sick, marriage, the, these rites that show God's presence in our lives in, very real, lives in a very real way. And of course, those important to are typically baptism and Eucharist. Those are the two that everybody usually agrees upon. And of course, in the Episcopal Church, they kind of take a middle approach where they recognize the two sacraments of the gospel, baptism and Eucharist, and then they have five additional ones mm -hmm. that give you the traditional seven that you see. Right. And, and so we, we strongly believe in that. We believe that these specific rites exist mm -hmm. and that these rites communicate God's grace and God's presence and that they're important steps in the life of the Christian church. Right. And... For me, I'm, I used to be very charismatic, and well, I mean, I'm still very charismatic, but I mean, like in more contemporary Pentecostal sense. Right. And what's interesting is the Pentecostal churches, even though they believe in the presence of the Spirit, they believe in God acting directly and literally in all these ways, but then when it comes to the sacraments, it just disappears. They right. believe that these are all symbolic, that they don't actually have any real, you know, material events. There's nothing really real to them. Right. It, it sounds strange to say it that way. Yeah, but that's that's why I can think of the way of putting it. It's a mystery. It's not right. supposed to be very easily grasped. Like it connects with you emotionally, but it doesn't do anything. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing really happening. Right. It's all symbolic or memorial. And so then I, I started thinking about that more myself, and I realized why is the spirit literally present when somebody speaks in tongues or prophesies, but Christ isn't literally present in the Eucharist when He says, "This is my body 
this is my butt. Like, why does why is the one person in the Trinity present, and not the other? Interesting. <laughs> so, um, that's that's kind of where the convergence movement gets to start with the sacramental theology. Right. If we believe that God is present in all these areas of life, not just the gifts of the Spirit, but also the sacraments of the Church. Awesome. Thank you so much. Those are very helpful clarifications. Now, with the last few minutes that we have together, I want to run quickly through a couple of questions. Um, primarily, this interview is for my religion in the United States students. Um, so, in brief, uh, what does the American context have to do with the formation of the Convergence Christian movement and its particular emphasis on the aforementioned points? What is it about being in this country, in this place, that you think might have helped shape the formation of this movement? Well, think about the way we traditionally define the church. It's very Eurocentric. Right. You know, we, we typically say there's Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestants. Right. And that's, just, that's Europe. That's all it is. That's, you only see that in Europe. It, but if you go outside of Europe, you see a bunch of different new expressions of the church. So you go to, East, you go to um, the Middle East, you have the Oriental Orthodox. Right. You go to South, Southern Asia, you have the Church of the East. You go to um, like Latin America and Africa today, you see a bunch of new religious movements that pop up and emerge. Mm -hmm. And the Convergence Movement was perfectly, it, it, the United States was just, it's a perfect context for something like this to happen. Because you have the, the birth of Pentecostalism here. Right. You have massive waves of, of immigrants here. You have all these different traditions that were separate by, you know, separated in Europe by national boundaries coming together to the United States and actually encountering one another directly for the first time. Mm -hmm. So the United States is just the perfect melting pot for this type of spiritual movement to happen. Right. But since then, it's, emer it's emerged out of the United States and spread all over, much like Pentecostalism has. Right. But where it's spread is all the former colonial territories. It's Latin America, Africa, Southern Asia. Right. Because they have a very similar history there being this place where people came from different backgrounds. Right. That's excellent. Thank you. Uh, okay, last thing. What's the best thing about being in the Convergence Christian movement? What's the thing you like most about your tradition? I think it's the fact that we can appreciate everybody and take from everybody. Right. Some people might see that as appropriating, uh -huh. but for us, it's more of a more of paying respect to. Right. The fact of the matter is that we're not limited by being Episcopalian or Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or Methodist or Baptist. We're not limited by specific denominational constraints. Instead, we want to appreciate everybody and work with everybody. And so I think that the, the convergence movement gives people a lot of freedom in that, in that regard. And also the fact that we are so open to the gifts of the spirit can be really liberating for a lot of people because the way when the spirit tends to move, you'll notice that the people that the mainstream institutions reject or mm -hmm. marginalize tend to be the ones that receive the spirit. Mm -hmm. And you see that in the scriptures. I mean, the, the prophetic school thought in the Hebrew Bible, they were constantly getting in trouble with the priests in the temple. Right. And in the New Testament, I mean, reaching out to the Gentiles, you know, giving salvation to eunuchs, mm -hmm. I mean, all these things were very controversial with the mainstream, mainstream religious institution. Right. And in the history of Pentecostal and Christianity, Christian, you see much the same thing. Um, just for example, one specific example, in Roman Catholic charismatic, Roman Catholic charismatic renewal, you had the this a lot of use of lay ministry, including women lay ministry. Mm -hmm. And that was something that really changed things for them. Because right. they were coming from this strictly clerical background, and it was an all-male clerical background. And so to have a charismatic movement enter into that, and to have the charismatic movement shape things up a little bit and give lay people, especially lay women, a lot more say in the life of the church, and that, that really changes things up for them. Right. This has been a very uh, enlightening interview. I've learned a lot about um, this movement that I hadn't really know much about until we started discussing. Um, and it's fascinating to see these different elements, elements which I'm familiar with in different contexts coming together in one place. Uh, and then hearing how this applies, uh, it's not only to my students' experience, but this particular class that they're in. And I hope that others who come across this interview on YouTube will enjoy it as well. Uh, so thank you so much, Father Kevin, for taking the time to interview with me this morning. And, thank you very much. Um, hope we can continue this conversation and maybe uh, jump back in on another topic in a future date. I'd love to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.